founded the firm in September 1985 with the vision of seeking truth and justice for our clients and not just winning their cases. Over the years, the team has achieved many significant milestones. We are today recognized by the Legal 500, Asia Law Profiles and Asian Legal Business as a recommended firm in various practice areas. While we have embraced technology to make our services efficient and responsive, we continue to grow on the bedrock of meticulous preparation and hard work, for which there is really no substitute. As legal practice becomes increasingly international, we keep ourselves ahead of the curve with our relationships with lawyers from around the world. Our firm is a founding member of the League of Lawyers, a growing international network of law firms in 20 Asian and European countries. We believe in partnering with our clients to protect and grow their business. We achieve this by holding firm to our values of integrity and justice while giving our best to deliver effective and efficient solutions. Instead of just legal services, we focus on developing great working relationships based on understanding and respect. The firm invests in its team and emphasizes professional development. We are keen to share our knowledge and publish our articles on our website. And we also give back with our corporate social responsibility activities. We cultivate a passion for the law and enjoy what we do. This brings out the best in us for our clients today and tomorrow. We regularly advise foreign clients, including many Chinese investors, and have a ready appreciation for different ways of doing business. In corporate matters, we offer relevant and commercial solutions, often raising issues that clients may or may not have realized before. In negotiations, we believe in facilitating win-win outcomes. everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for today's talk. The title of today's talk is Rescue Mechanism for Distressed Companies, Corporate Voluntary Arrangement. My name is Hannah and I'm the Senior Associate with Mawengwa and Associate and I will be your moderator for today's session. Before we start today's talk, let me introduce the firm and what we do. Mawengwa & Associates is a medium-sized law firm that was founded in 1985 by Dato Mawengwa. Our ABLE team today comprises 22 lawyers and a support team of 19. Dato Ma is today a consultant with the firm following his retirement from the Court of Appeal bench in 2015. The firm continues its tradition today, working primarily with small, medium, small, medium enterprises, family businesses, and individuals. We are a full service law firm with four departments, corporate, dispute resolution, employment, individuals, and families. Our dispute resolution department includes litigation, adjudication, and arbitration. Our practice groups are five. We have the ASEAN China Desk, Construction, Foreign Direct Investment, Real Estate, Sports, and Esports. Our practice group indicates some of our focus areas, which are supported by talents from both our corporate and dispute resolution teams. Today's talk is part of our Maui Kwai online talks uh, series. By way of background, we have been organizing monthly lunch talks at our office since 2013, some of which were also, which were also uh, broadcasted live. But with the COVID-19 lockdown, we have moved online to, in order to continue with our objective of sharing knowledge, raising awareness, and encouraging networking for clients, potential clients, and in-house counsel. 
please visit our website at www.maoinkwai.com for more information to read our articles and to sign up for more upcoming talks. Next, allow me to introduce our guest speakers for today. First up, we have Senior Associate Cassandra Tomasios. Cassandra is a Senior Associate in our Corporate Department. She holds a Bachelor of Law from the Northumbria University. She was called to the Bar of England and Wales in 2011. She was admitted to the Malaysian Bar in 2012 and also holds a Master's in Transitional Law in King's College, London. Her work primarily involves commercial and corporate matters, drafting corporate agreements and mergers and acquisition transition, transactions. Sorry. Next, we have Tommy Wong. Tommy Wong is an associate in our corporate department. He holds a Bachelor of Laws from the University of Hertfordshire from the Bar of in and he was called to the Bar of England and Wales in 2017. He was admitted to the Malaysian Bar in 2019. He also in, he's also involved in commercial and corporate matters, drafting corporate project agreements and M&A transactions. Finally, we have Felicia. Felicia is a member of our corporate team. She, is, she holds a Bachelor of Law from the University of Leeds. She was called to the Bar of England and Wales in 2018 and admitted to the Malaysian Bar in 2020. She is also involved in commercial and corporate matters, drafting corporate project agreements and M&A transactions. Without further ado, I will now hand over the uh, floor to the speakers. On to you, Felicia. Thank you, Hannah. Um, good morning, everyone. On behalf of me, first, I would like to thank everyone who is here with us this morning. And I hope that after this talk, um, all of you will have a better idea about the corporate rescue mechanisms, as well as restructuring and reschedule um, rescue options for businesses and companies in Malaysia. Let's begin. Um, I'll quickly go through the top points that are here for today's talk. We will begin with some background of the movement control order that is currently being implemented. Um, then we'll move on to talk about the types of corporate rescue mechanisms in Malaysia. And we'll look at two specific types of rescue mechanisms, which are the judicial management and corporate voluntary arrangement. We will then also look at the provisions under the Companies Act 2016 um, on corporate voluntary arrangement. And following that, we'll provide you with an outline about, um, on the SSM guidelines on corporate voluntary arrangement. And lastly, we'll share with you some practical steps that can be taken by distressed companies in Malaysia. I believe that everyone here is aware of the movement control order that is currently being implemented throughout our country. The order is issued pursuant to Section 11.2 of the Prevention and Control of Infectious Diseases Act 1988. The, on the 18th of March, the PCID regulations were gazetted. Um, both the PCID uh, the, mo both the movement control order and the regulations have effect from the 18th of March until initially the 31st of March, but have since been extended to the 14th of April. Order is an effort to contain the spread of the COVID-19 outbreak by restricting the movements of Malaysians and only allowing several categories of businesses that are considered as essential services to operate. And as a result of this movement control order, it certainly increases the risk of companies as well as small businesses from going involved. So we will now move on to um, talking about the types of 
copper rescue mechanisms that are available for these companies as well as small businesses. Two mechanisms are provided under Division 8 of Part 3 of the Companies Act 2016, which came into force on the 1st of March 2018. It came into effect together with the company's Copper Rescue Mechanism Rules 2018. Basically, these rescue, rescue mechanisms aim at facilitating financially distressed companies to rehabilitate the financial and business viabilities of these companies and also to restore the profitability of the company rather than resorting into a winding up scenario. As mentioned earlier, the two mechanisms which we will be focusing on today that are under the Companies Act 2016 are judicial management and corporate voluntary arrangement. The gist of these rescue mechanisms is that they can provide a temporary shelter um, for a company while allowing them to either refinance or perhaps reschedule any credit facilities or even securities that they might have. So we'll start with an introduction to judicial management, the first type of uh, rescue mechanism which we will be um, discussing today. The judicial management procedure allows a distressed company or its creditors to apply for an order to place the company under the management of a qualified insolvency practitioner, who is also known as a judicial manager who will be appointed by the court. The role of a judicial manager is to prepare and table a restructuring plan, or some call it a proposal for a creditor's approval. And upon the approval of the proposal or the restructuring plan, the judicial manager will be in charge to oversee the implementation of the restructuring plan and proposal. The following parties here will be entitled to make an application um, to, for a judicial management order to the court. The parties that are entitled are the company, the directors of the company, and the creditors of the company. However, a judicial management order is not available to any licensed institution or an operator um, that is regulated under the laws enforced by the Bank of Malaysia or that are um, subject to the Capital Market and Services Act 2007. Basically, a judicial management order is not available to a bank, a finance company, or an insurance company. They are also unavailable if the company has gone into liquidation. The court um, will grant a judicial management order if it is satisfied that the company will not be able to pay its debt. And the making of the judicial management order would likely result in one of the following scenarios here. The first is that there is a reasonable probability that either the whole or only a part of um, the business or company will survive, or it can be that the order is a better way to realize the company's assets as compared to a winding up, or it can be that the creditor will be in a better position than if the company is to be wound up. We we'll now talk about the essential features of a judicial management. Upon application, a moratorium will be automatically applied um, against legal all legal proceedings against the companies that are initiated by the creditors of the company. And the effect of this is that it will stay any legal proceedings for 180 days. And this moratorium gives the company some breathing space to, uh, or to allow it to restructure um, its debt or to obtain or perhaps obtain any um, additional 
uh, financing or basically to rearrange uh, an alternative arrangement with the company's creditors. The moratorium may be extended for another 180 days upon application of the judicial manager. Um, the judicial manager will then have 60 days to send the restructuring plan or the proposal that we mentioned earlier to the members and the creditors for their approval and consideration. And the, the approval level that is required here is 75% in value of the creditors' claims, which have been accepted by the judicial manager. And once the proposal has been approved by the creditors at the creditors' meeting um, by a required majority, um, the proposals will be binding on all creditors, regardless of whether or not they have um, voted in favour of the proposal. Next, the second type of corporate rescue mechanism, which we will be looking at today in detail, is the corporate voluntary arrangement. This is a procedure which allows the company to put a proposal to its creditors, as the name suggests, for, um, for a voluntary for a voluntary arrangement. Essentially, this approach is asking the creditors to accept a reduced payment of the sum owed by the company. This arrangement is su supervised by an independent insolvency practitioner who would report to the court on the viability of the proposal that has been put forward by the company. The process um, is management driven um, with minimal intervention from the court. And as such, it would be a much quicker process that also involves um, lower costs. A corporate voluntary arrangement um, can be proposed by the directors or even shareholders of a private company. However, it cannot be proposed by public companies um, or it can, it can be proposed by banks, financial institutions, or insurance companies as well. And it is also unavailable to companies which have a charge over its property or any of its undertakings. That's all for me for now, and I will hand it over to my colleague, Tommy, and he will take it from here. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Felicia, for the for the brief introduction. Um, also, I'd like to apologize to everyone for the slight technical error on the, the shuffling noise behind back, uh, in the background. All right. Um, firstly, my name is Tommy and uh, I'll be touching on the topic of corporate voluntary arrangement under the Companies Act. Uh, as Felicia mentioned earlier, the application for voluntary arrangement uh, may be proposed by directors of a company uh, or the judicial manager or the liquidator or rec official receiver. But before an applicant can make an application for such schemes, uh, the applicant must ensure that there are no pending queries with SSM and all company information on SSM are up to date. Now, the proposal is uh, for for CVA, it's, it, it is prepared by directors, judicial manager, the official receiver or liquidator as the case may be. Uh, importantly, the proposal must include uh, a nomination of a nominee, uh, either as a trustee or supervisor, along with a statement that uh, the company's information on SSM has been up to date and the company is not under any striking off process. Now, probably you, you'll be wondering who is the nominee. Uh, as per the Corporate Rescue Mechanism Section 394 of the Companies Act, a nominee is any person who is qualified to be appointed as an insolvency practitioner. And the powers and duties vested in a nominee, uh, it, it includes monitoring the company's affairs uh, to form an opinion on whether the proposed voluntary arrangement has a reasonable prospect of approval and implementation. 
together with whether the company is likely to have sufficient funds uh, to carry on its business during the morator moratorium bis uh, period. If, if necessary, uh, the, the nominee has a power as well to request uh, any necessary documents from the official receiver or the directors of the company uh, and, they, and, and, and the nominee can rely on such documents and information to, to, to form such opinion. Now, the proposal for a CVA is definitely comprehensive. Now, in addition to uh, the, the, the documents that has been uh, set up in the slide, uh, it, it, is, it also uh, in, include, includes the powers and duties and responsibilities of a supervisor if there is such person uh, appointed. Also, uh, it includes actions to be taken in the event of default and also future performance uh, to support the proposal. But more importantly, uh, propo the proposal for CVA has to include uh, a state, the statement from uh, the nominee's uh, opinion on whether uh, on, on the reasonable, uh, reasonable prospect of uh, the approval and implementation of uh, the proposed CVA, uh, also the likelihood of the company having sufficient funds uh, to carry on its business during the moratorium period. And it should also include the statement uh, of the meetings of the company's members and creditors, uh, which will be summoned by the, 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 the nominee uh, to consider the proposal. Obviously, after that, all, all these documents are, 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 are in order. And uh, after uh, filing the, the, the said documents in court, there, there will be a period uh, known as the moratorium uh, period, which will commence automatically, and uh, such period lasts for 28 days. Uh, and during this, this period, uh, no legal proceedings can be commenced against the company. Uh, also, creditors uh, are, are not allowed to take any further steps against the company to, to recover their debts. There's also uh, a leeway for the moratorium period to be extended. Uh, and if this period is, ex uh, is, uh, is, uh, is extended with uh, approval by 75 majority in value of the creditors uh, at the creditors meeting and with the consent of the nominee and uh, the company members, uh, it can extend to, uh, to a period of uh, in totality, uh, 60 days. So basically, in addition to the 20, original 28 days, uh, the, the extended period itself is 32 days. So it, it, it does not go further than 60 days in, to, in total. Thereafter, uh, the meeting of the company's members and creditors uh, will be summoned by the nominee. And the nominee will be sending out uh, a notice of such meeting to all creditors and members of the company. At, at the company's meeting, uh, for the approval uh, of the CVA, it, it only requires a simple majority. Uh, at such meetings, uh, at such, such a meeting, uh, there's only four possible outcomes, whether the proposal of the CVA is approved or disapproved, or, or the extension of the moratorium period is approved and thereafter the establishment of a moratorium committee. Uh, uh, or lastly, the disapproval to extend the moratorium period. The approval of the CVA, uh, the approval of the proposed CVA rather, uh, this binds all creditors and these creditors will be prevented from taking any further steps against the company as mentioned earlier. Uh, a secured creditor will not be able to enforce the security during this moratorium period uh, unless they obtain the consent of the court. Now this whole, with, with the approval of the CVA, this 
corporate rescue mechanism will actually protect uh, a company who, which is which is in financial difficulty, of course. And after the the, the approval of the CVA, uh, the nominee has the duty to notify the court, and thereafter uh, the company will be able to implement the CVA. Uh, with after all this uh, uh, are said and done, uh, the status of the company on SSM will be updated to reflect that the company is under voluntary arrangement. Now, when the company is in, in the midst of a moratorium uh, period, uh, there are also situations that can end the period as well. Uh, the, the, the six situations are, are, are laid out in a slide. Uh, withdrawal of uh, the nominee's consent to act uh, or is no longer, for example, a, a, a qualified insolvency practitioner or the proposal has been in, approved or disapproved and no notification to extend the moratorium period has been filed in court upon its expiry. So in, in, in addition to uh, the Division 8 of the Companies Act, uh, the corporate re rescue mechanism for, for, for judicial management, uh, for corporate voluntary arrangement, it is also set up in the guidelines for corporate rescue mechanism. Um, these guidelines are issued uh, pursuant to Section 20C of the Companies Commission of Malaysia Act 2001. Now, its main purpose is to, is to educate and inform uh, all relevant applicants uh, on the general requirements in relation to the application uh, and the procedure for these corporate rescue mechanisms. Now, there's a link to the guidelines uh, that can be found on the slide. Uh, and the guidelines for corporate rescue, uh, for corporate voluntary arrangement is, they are, they are all summed up and summarized in the next slide. So firstly, uh, the directors of a company, uh, and as the case may be, the judicial manager or official receiver may propose an application for CVA. But again, as mentioned earlier, prior to, prior, prior to the proposal, the applicant must ensure that uh, all information on SSM for, uh, in relation to the company are up to date and that there's no pending query. Then again, flowchart goes to after having all the documents in place, the director's judicial manager, official receiver, or liquidated, again, as the case may be, will file the relevant documents uh, into court. Automatically, the moratorium period commences uh, and remains in force for 28 days. Uh, if there's a proposal to extend the moratorium period, it can be extended for, in itself, a period of 32 days uh, in addition to the original 28 days, making it a total of 60 days. Then thereafter, the nominee has to summon a meeting of members and creditors uh, for the main purpose of either to approve or disapprove the proposal uh, for the CVA or even to extend the moratorium period. That is very important because it is one of the main duties and obligations of the nominee uh, once all these meetings have, uh, in the event, uh, in in the event of approval of the of the pro uh, proposed voluntary arrangement, it becomes binding on all creditors, regardless of how they all voted. Uh, if they if they approved or disapproved, it's still binding. Uh, the company will be protected uh, during the moratorium period, and the the voting threshold at these meetings for members is a simple majority of. Uh, 50% or more. Uh, and in, in, in regards to creditors, uh, it is a 75% in value of the creditors present at the meeting. Uh, on, a, on a side note, again, if there's such person, uh, such a person now uh, uh, appointed, the supervisor is required to be in charge of the implement, implementation of the arrangement. In conclusion, basically, in simple terms, uh, a corporate voluntary arrangement uh, and its moratorium period generally, generally provides a company who is in 
uh, financial difficulty, uh, additional time to defer uh, payment of uh, due and outstanding debts to, to its creditors, and to, to, to have that additional time to carry on its business, uh, to facilitate the recovery of monies in order to pay off such debts. Now, this is the, this, these corporate uh, rescue mechanisms, uh, in particular right now, the corporate voluntary arrangement, uh, it, is to, it, it is an alternative to uh, having the company uh, be, be, be subject to uh, liquidation directly. It, it gives the company time to, 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 to operate uh, and also the, the, the privilege of having uh, to halt any debts due and owing to creditors. So with that said, uh, my time has come to an end and I'll, I'll, I'll be uh, more than honored to pass the next slide on to my colleague Cassandra to speak further on the topic. Thanks, Tommy, for that introduction and for gaining corporate voluntary arrangements. To summarize the points and take it over from here, I think what we will do is we will go through key summary points. Uh, before I do that, though, I do want to say that if any of you have any questions um, that you want to ask us, you can feel free to do it on Slido or in the chat and we will answer it at the end of this presentation. With that being said, the key summary points is whether or not the CVA pr procedure, first of all, to highlight, allows a private company or public company. Now, to summarize, public companies are not subject to a corporate voluntary arrangement. This procedure allows private companies to put up a proposal to its creditors. And the implementation of this proposal is usually supervised by an independent insolvency practitioner who would report to the court on the viability of the proposal. Now, what does this mean? This means that an insolvency practitioner would have to include their own proposal, which is their own opinions and their views on whether or not the proposal for the corporate voluntary arrangement is viable and feasible. Uh, the difference between this and insolvency procedures is that the corporate voluntary arrangement is not a winding up procedure. It does not wind up the company, nor does it cater for comprehensive insolvency issues if the company is severely financially distressed. It does not also apply to secured creditors. What does this mean? This means that secured and unsecured creditors, the difference between these two are collateral. Now, collateral means when you have, say, for example, a housing loan, the bank issues you a loan, and in return, they put a lien or a charge over your property. With that being said, that would mean that the bank is a secured creditor and that the bank as a secured creditor will not be subject to the corporate voluntary arrangement. However, with that being said, um, the key feature of this corporate voluntary arrangement is that during the moratorium period, the corporate voluntary arrangement generally provides that the company has time to defer repayment to carry on its business. So, for example, if you have a secured creditor, such as a bank, the bank will normally usually enter into something called a receivership proceeding. Now that can only be done with the leave of court. And this allows the company a little bit of breathing space. That breathing space is given to the company as a form of rehabilitation for them to give, to, to give them a little bit of time so that they can compromise with their creditors and come up with a feasible and reliable <laughs> Whoever has not muted their speakers would do so. Thank you. Um, so now, going back to the key summary pro, uh, points, um, the pertinent point being that the moratorium period under a corporate voluntary arrangement provides the company additional time to defer repayments. 
Now, this is done so that in the process of negotiating with the creditors, um, they have time to carry on the business to facilitate a recovery arrangement so that whatever debts they're being owed rather than going into liquidation directly, they can discuss this recovery period with their creditors on a feasible option, which is then reviewed by the insolvency practitioner. Now, a few disadvantages of the corporate voluntary arrangement is that when your CVA proposal is issued and filed in court, your creditors need to know exactly how much you are able to pay and you know, what your standing point financially is. So they will essentially have access to all assets and liabilities which you have declared in your proposal. So this instead promotes transparency. It promotes transparency in the sense that the company's assets and liabilities are all laid out for creditors to review, to see what their financial distress is, to help them negotiate and see a clearer picture of how essentially they can come up with a compromise with its creditors so that everything is on a transparent level. Now the arrangement for a corporate voluntary arrangement is binding on all creditors, which leaves minimum flexibility for renegotiation. What do I mean by this? So an example of this is say, for example, a proposal is negotiated with creditors to say they only need to pay 50% of their debt due and owing, and the other 50% is struck off. Now, in future, if the company can, cannot pay that 50%, which they agreed to under the corporate voluntary arrangement, what this means is there's no rooms for renegotiation because that CVA proposal is already binding. So what should distressed companies do? Here are a few practical steps for what distressed companies should think about and should consider between their creditors and their members of the company. One, they should determine the company's financial distress. By this, they should explore whether the company can pay its debts within the next 12 months. Has there been a significant impact on cash flow in terms of financing, investing, and operating? They should also consider credit or unsecured creditors in terms of their debts or loans being owed. So say for example, if they have debts or loans which go into the millions and they are unable to pay off that loan, they have to explore the option of whether their creditors are able to negotiate or come to a compromise to them. Because the corporate voluntary arrangement makes no sense if you have five creditors who are all not willing to negotiate their debts with the distressed company and they may not even vote in favor of the proposal. In this case, it is also the independent practitioner's object objective to review and see whether it's a viable option or not. So what distressed companies usually do is that it is pertinent that these financial distressing, uh, determinants of financially distressed companies are reviewed by a financial advisor so that financial advisors can advise them moving forward to explore what options would work best for them and their creditors. Now, the other practical steps would be the prospects of whether they're willing to accept a proposal or not. I think it is easier to gauge from an earlier point of view, from an earlier standpoint whether or not their unsecured creditors would be willing to accept a negotiation a negotiated proposal with them a further practical step would be to consider the nature of whether there are any legal actions against the company so an example of this would be whether the company already has uh, several outstanding uh, legal action against them and if someone has already filed winding up proceedings against them, this might be a, um, a point to consider for the company before they enter into a CVA. Now, practical examples of a corporate voluntary arrangement could be a agreement between a company and creditors to repay debts over an extended period of time. So an example of this, say, for example, an unsecured creditor may be a creditor for supply of goods. 
And in that event, they are unable to pay for that supply of goods and they have an agreement to say that they are supposed to pay it within 12 months. Now, a corporate voluntary arrangement could bring creditors to the table to renegotiate. So perhaps instead of repayment of debt over a 12 month period, they now extend that to a 24 month period. And that agreement will include details of the debts as well. So it could very well be a situation where the creditor has allowed the company to repay the debt of only 80% instead of 20. So they've essentially given them a 20% discount. And this will be recorded under the corporate voluntary arrangement and that will be binding for the company um, in the future. Now, interest and charges are usually frozen uh, for corporate voluntary arrangements and the creditor action is stayed when the CVA comes into force. By this, I mean if the, cre the creditor is not allowed to sue the company for a 12 month uh, to the company for the debt due and owing when a corporate voluntary arrangement has already been agreed to. Now, and a, a further example of this during a CVA is where the company defaults, say for example, a rental or fails to comply with any term or condition of a tenancy agreement. During the moratorium period, as Tommy earlier explained, the landlord or any other person who is receiving the rental can not exercise a right of forfeiture by re-entry or exercise um, file a legal action in court for claim over the rental for the demise premises if it is tenanted unless the court's consent has been obtained. Now, this means that the moratorium gives the distressed company room to breathe because they're not able creditors and unsecured creditors are not allowed to sue them unless express consent by the court is given. So apart from a corporate voluntary arrangement, what else can companies do if they're financially distressed? A few items here come to mind, which is a corporate restructuring exercises for a group of companies. Some bigger companies choose to do so under a corporate voluntary arrangement. And some companies choose to do it as an independent exercise. The idea behind this is so that dominant entities uh, and subsidiaries within the group of companies are closed to ease cash flow. Another option could be crowdfunding, uh, P2P crowdfunding or equity crowdfunding. <clears throat> Or it could very well also be third party financing that the companies may have and we call them white clients that come in and usually a third party financing. Sometimes it's also done under a corporate voluntary arrangement where third party financing comes in to ease cash flow and renegotiate debts with creditors. Other options could be raising capital in the, con uh, in the company in exchange for equity or settlement agreements. Now, settlement agreements are very common because a lot of companies essentially renegotiate their debts with creditors in exchange for either properties or in exchange for a longer period of time to pay the debt. And this helps financially distressed companies ease their, debt, uh, their debts to be paid over a longer period of time or to renegotiate the same with creditors. So I believe that are the key summary points and practical steps moving forward for companies who are engaging in corporate voluntary arrangement. Let's see if we have any slido questions. We do have one slido question, which is not directly related to corporate voluntary arrangement. Now this question um, relates to worker salary. During the MCO, worker salary has to be paid in full. And the question is, is there other conditions that we can consider to reduce this financial constraint? Now, even though this is not part of the CBA, which is our topic for today, uh, in order for worker salaries to be negotiated and discussed, I think what can be done is that the workers and the company need to agree on partial, whether they are agree, whether they are happy to accept a reduced salary or a partial payment. This unfortunately must be mutual between both the worker and the company with an agreement and understanding between the two of them.
we do have two other questions. So we have a question which says, may I know what is meant by charges frozen when section 395 expressly says that a corporate voluntary arrangement is not applicable to a company with charges. So what this means is that, say for example, an unsecured creditor has a charge over an asset. Now a charge over an asset could be a private caveat and they want to enforce that private caveat over a company's asset. That doesn't necessarily mean that they are a secured creditor. They could still very well be an unsecured creditor and their charge over the assets could be because of a su supply of goods perhaps. Now this means that essentially no act legal action can be taken against the company and that charge is frozen until after the moratorium period. I hope that answers the question. Um, other questions we have is a company has a right to cut employees wages, for example, unpaid leave for a second MCO. I think uh, what we will do is I will leave the employment wages and um, employment sector for our next talk, which, uh, our talk which is coming up, I think next week. We have a question where they have asked if a 75% in value of creditors, what does that mean? Now, 75% means a um, special majority. A special majority, a majority of creditors means 75% or more approval. A simple majority refers to 51% or more. Okay. We have any more questions? Send it back over to you now, Hannah, unless there are any other questions from anyone. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Cassandra. Let me just um, share. All right, thank you, Cassandra, Tommy, and Felicia for your insights. And I hope to our guests, uh, thank you for joining us. I hope that you found this uh, informative and useful. Before we conclude, I have a few announcements to make. Uh, as mentioned by Cassandra earlier, we do have a talk on entrenchment uh, next week. Uh, but this is the list of upcoming talks that we have. We have one on Wednesday, business continuity, the show must go on. On Friday, we have something for the Muslims, the Sharia estate planning, Mawasiat and Hiba. And next Monday, a retrenchment during the COVID-19 pandemic. Sign up, you may sign up um, at this website at the talks sign up uh, tab in our, in our website or go to the events tab in our website. I'm gonna leave the link right now at the chat so that you can have a look at um, where you can sign up. Sorry, I'm having a little bit of a hiccup here. Hang on, hang on a minute, yeah, okay. Okay, I'm going to share with you the link to sign up for our talks. Okay, so visit this link so that you can register for our next talks. And we see that there are a lot of questions on retrenchment, so please do sign up. Next, please fill in our feedback form. Tell us what you know to hear, what you want to know or what you want to hear from us. I'll link the form as well in the, oh, the link is already up. The link is already up in the chat group, so you can do that as well. Third, please follow or like our social media accounts. We have Facebook accounts, Instagram account, as well as Twitter account. And find, fourthly, next, if you would like to speak to our lawyer, I'm sure you have a lot more questions coming up after this talk. You, we offer you a 30 minute complimentary consultation over telephone or video conference. And you may sign up through the link that we have just posted on the chat as well. All right, is everybody clear? Are we all good? Great, thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you.